Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, this session of the Dublin Economics Workshop. Sorry, I had a technical problem there, but I think we've sorted it out. And uh, this session is on Brexit. Uh, things can uh, can only get better. And uh, for those who thought that Brexit uh, had gone away, it uh, has uh, re-emerged again the last few days with uh, uh, some uh, some announcements from from uh, from London. So we're going to spend the next hour and a half talking about Brexit, and we have uh, three speakers, normal format, three speakers, and then we'll have a Q&A. So when it comes to the Q&A, our preference is if you could use the Q&A function, if you could uh, type in the question, and we'll try try as best we can to get, get to your questions during the session. So we have three speakers, Rory Mont uh, Montgomery, uh, formerly of a colleague of mine, and formerly from the Department of Foreign Affairs, Katie Howard from Queen's University of Belfast, and Ben Breen is an official here in uh, in Deeper. Uh, so you're all very, very welcome uh, to our speakers. So uh, we are going to start uh, with uh, Rory Montgomery, who will speak about 15 minutes. And uh, so Rory, over to you. Okay, just, I was just unmuting myself there. Well, thanks very much, Robert. Um, and it's great to be back at the uh, Dublin Economics Workshop. I spoke to you about three years ago, I think, uh, down in Wexford. And the advantage of Wexford was that I was able to have a couple of pints after speaking, but that pleasure is denied me uh, today. Um, I don't know who chose the, the title, but I wondered, was it a conscious echo of Tony Blair's campaign song in 1997? And one remembers that he marched into Downing Street on that triumphant morning in May, uh, with the with the music playing, uh, and of course at that point, the Labour Party, the new Labour government, was in principle committed to joining the euro. So how much things have changed uh, since then? There's a lot of pessimism around um, here, as you can imagine, um, and the particular issue that you mentioned, Robert, has only added to the pessimism. Um, the Irish Times has a headline today. UK threat to renege on agreement hits hopes of trade deal. Now, I will recall that we've had similar headlines in the past. On the 13th of November, uh, 2017, growing fears of Brexit talks set to collapse. And on the 2nd of September last year, high risk of no deal Brexit as UK faces crunch decision. Now, I'm not saying that one can uh, blandly uh, assume that it will be all right on the night, far, far from it. And answer the question at the end, um, but at the same time, it's clearly uh, a very you know it's clearly that the, in the past things have not worked out as badly as might have been feared at various at various points, and it, it underlines that these negotiations can be very unpredictable. Just a very quick recap: as you all know, the withdrawal agreement, including the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, which Katie Hayward will be talking about in in a while, um, was signed at the end of October last year. It was accompanied by a political declaration um, setting out the what was uh, meant to be the framework of future relations between the EU and the UK. Uh, Brexit Day itself was the end of January. And then a couple of months after that, negotiations began on the future relationship. And just to be clear, of course, that what is most often discussed and gets the most attention are issues of trade and goods, um, including agricultural products. And those issues are complicated in themselves. But if you look at the EU negotiating mandate, for example, it covers a lot of different areas, uh, trade in, in services, um, mobility, uh, cross-border mobility of different kinds, the question of air transport and road transport services, uh, and very importantly, cooperation in justice and home affairs matters on issues like the European uh, arrest warrant, for example, which is really important um, and uh, very important for Ireland as, as well. So there's a broad range of issues, uh, and many of these are being discussed in the current talks, the latest round of which started in London yesterday. And again, I think as most of you know, financial services um, are separate. Uh, they are being uh, treated in the usual way in which the EU looks at financial services uh, access from third countries um, by whether or not, deeming whether or not there is equivalence between the regimes in, in the whole range of different financial services, uh, sort of one by one. Now, when the negotiations began, I mean, the UK rather sharply lowered the level of ambition which was set out uh, in the political declaration. I believe that all talk of ambition 
and partnership um, has been banned uh, in British government circles. And you know, one of the lines has been that the general election victory, uh, which Boris won in December, the Tories won in December, somehow supersedes or bypasses uh, the, it, its commitment to the political declaration. Now, we haven't heard it directly challenge the withdrawal agreement until the last day or two, uh, but it gives you a sense uh, of what you may be dealing with. I think it's fair to say, from the very beginning, and this goes right back to discussions within the EU, which I took part in, there's a fundamental question, or a couple of fundamental questions, um, which you know underpin, I think, a lot of the problems. The first question is, what are the implications of the UK's proximity to the EU, the size of its economy compared to other EU trade partners, the fact that there is at present a shared rule book. And the EU and the UK have tended to draw quite different conclusions from those phenomena. From the EU side, the UK is a strong potential competitor. The UK will argue that it makes sense to have a particularly close relationship in those areas which suits it. Um, and then there's the meaning of sovereignty, of course, an issue which is familiar from some of our own referendum debates, um, but which in the UK has really come to the fore. It's strange when you think about it because the big issue um, in the referendum was immigration uh, and there were financial issues as well, but sovereignty is the issue that they keep coming back to. Um, now, as Michel Barnier, when he was here in Dublin a couple of weeks ago, made clear, certain things will change um, at the end of this year whether there's a deal or no deal. And he picked out three examples. There will be customs formalities um, at the borders between the EU and the UK, other than in Ireland. And um, for example, the UK will lose, um, the UK type approval for cars will no longer be recognized. And of course, there will be a loss of financial passporting rights. But if there's no deal, of course, there are additional problems in all, in all areas. Um, as you can as you can imagine, um, I mean the the issue is that um, you know for example there will be tariffs and quotas in some areas, and for the UK these would include sensitive areas like cars and and lamb, and of course the big implications for the rest of us as well with trade in the other direction, um, and you know there will be no cooperation strictly speaking just as home affairs matters or they have people will have to revert to older and less efficient forms of cooperation. And the same is true across the board. Um, now, it's hard to believe that you know, a patchwork of arrangements mightn't be, um, mightn't be put in place of temporary arrangements, but they'll fall a long way short of what even a, a modest deal uh, could achieve. Now, the negotiations, as you know, have been stuck on a range of issues. Uh, the main ones, again, are spelled out by Barnier, the question of state aids and the level playing field, the question of fisheries, and then the overall structure of the agreement and dispute resolution. There's no disagreement, I think, on what the issues are, but there's lots of where blame lies. And my understanding is from my colleagues in foreign affairs that there has been reasonable progress in specialist subgroups on the range of other issues that I mentioned, but obviously it depends on unblocking the main ones. The UK have, has wanted a sort of a, a, a system of banking you know, agreements in some areas on a nothing is agreed till everything is agreed basis. Barnier has been resisting that. I mean, it might seem rather bizarre um, that fisheries and state aids are so difficult um, because if you look at the share of fisheries in the EU economy, in the UK, fisheries contributes less than 0.1% of GDP. Ireland is, is as far as I can ascertain, about 0.4% of GNI. The total contribution of agriculture and fisheries to the French economy is about 1.5%. And of course, fisheries is of no interest to most member states. And then if you look at the latest EU figures, a couple of years old, on state aids, the, the weird thing is that even under the present rule book, the UK, the U, UK state aids as a proportion of GDP are a great deal lower um, than those in, in, in other countries. I mean, the UK, you know, UK state aids amounted to, authorised state aids amounted to about 0.4% of GDP two years ago, a quarter of German state aid and half of French. Ireland is one of the very few countries with a lower uh, contribution to state aids. And at present, of course, it's bizarre because the state aid, the competition rule book has been essentially suspended for the duration of the pandemic. It'll be quite an effort to bring it back into place, I would think. Um, and also, uh, even before this, the French in particular and others were always pushing for 
uh, reform of competition policy to allow more flexibility in supporting European champions. So you might ask yourself, well, why are these issues so totemic? Um, the EU, it's fair to say, has moved a certain amount. I mean, Barnier again made clear that on fisheries, there's an acceptance that UK fishermen will have to get a larger share uh, of, of catches in their waters, not as much as they're looking for. And then on state aids, the EU has moved away from looking for a, a sort of rigid sort of copy paste approach into an acceptance that there could be different regimes, but what matters are equivalent outcomes. But the UK position um, has been harder and more rhetorical and um, obsessed with sovereignty. David Frost, who is the chief negotiator, who actually was my opposite number about 20 years ago during the negotiation of what became the Lisbon Treaty, keeps talking about sovereignty and Britain cannot be a client state, etc. And then there are these sort of inconclusive musings about a different economic model within the UK. Um, there is a link, just to say, there are many problems, but Katie will talk about the Irish Protocol, but even before the last couple of days, I think it would be naive to think that there wasn't a link to overall negotiations. And Sam Lowe, who's an expert on trade, works for the Centre for Economic Reform, he said a couple of months ago, quote, it is difficult to see how this arrangement, i.e. the protocol, could survive a presumably acrimonious failure to conclude a trade agreement. So the Irish issue, whether we like it or not, is there in the ether, or has been there in the ether, even if it has now come back more clearly off the table. Now, is the UK for real, or is, or is it not? Very hard to say. I mean, nobody, I think, knows who the real Boris Johnson is, um, if indeed there is a real Boris Johnson. His style and personality don't lead one to be very confident. But on the other hand, he did reach a deal last year. He reached a deal essentially, as was pointed out over the weekend by Theresa May's chief of staff, by accepting 95% of what May had negotiated and backpedaling on another 5%, betraying the unionists as he went. But he claimed this was a brilliant new oven-ready deal. So he's capable of putting lipstick on a pig, no question. Or is he adopting, as my old EU ambassador colleague Kim Darek was saying yesterday, is he adopting a kind of a Trumpian madman approach whereby he causes so much chaos that the EU will be you know, forced to, uh, to settle? I mean, it seems clear as well that there are differences of view within the cabinet and within the Tory party on future British economic and fiscal policy and the potential importance of state aids there. And that's a very clear dividing line and uh, which we can talk about perhaps in the Q&A. And then where do other players stand? I think the opposition Clearly, I think a lot of the opposition, both within the party and more particularly in, in, the, in Labour, will be flushed out by the current you know, Irish controversy. But I think it's very much fair to say that Keir Starmer has been desperate to avoid reopening the wounds of the Brexit debate um, and hasn't wanted to be seen, to quote David Cameron, as banging on about Europe. So Starmer, I think, will be very reluctant, um, full-throatedly, to attack Boris uh, on the substance of negotiations. He's open, of course, to, if there are disastrous outcomes, he will, of course, um, raise that. Business, I think it's fair to say that every US, UK business presumably wants a deal. But again, business spokespeople have been quite chastened, I think, by their experience during the, the Brexit debate earlier. Within Brussels and in EU capitals, I think it's fair to say, again, I've heard this in foreign affairs, members, I mean, other member states have been very disengaged. The discussions have mostly been at technical level in Brussels, not even ambassador level. And there's very little sign of much interest uh, at this point. That can change and probably will change over the next period, but it's not a major, a major factor uh, so far. So on the one hand, Barnier is getting strong support, but his support hasn't really been tested. And then one other point, which I think is relevant in all this, is that I saw that Macron spoke to Boris Johnson on Monday about other matters and pronounced himself very pleased with their conversation. So it's fair to say that the bigger geopolitical issues, which are a particular concern to France and Germany, Britain has largely been on the European side um, over the last number of months, including crucially on Iran and the nuclear deal and on the Middle East. Uh, it's been taking the side more of France and Germany and the EU than it has. Patricia. Yeah, I've almost got, yeah, I'm, I'll be going to finishing soon. And of course, Boris must have an eye on the US elections, where if there is a new President Biden, presumably Biden would be less sympathetic than Trump. 
uh, to the chaos horrors which have been unleashed. And we've seen that the US Congress or the House of Representatives has already made clear its hostility to a deal which it discommodes Ireland. And then finally, what can or should um, Ireland do? Um, the answer, to be honest, is very little. Um, I mean, it is understood that we are more affected by Brexit in substance than by any other member state, that is any other member state. This was made clear uh, by Barnier in Dublin uh, last week. But the reality is that you know, we, we have little choice uh, but to adhere uh, to the Barnier uh, and the EU mandate. A, because it largely suits us and we were involved in drawing it up. But of course, we were, you know, since the consequences of no deal um, are so bad for us, clearly, I imagine, we would be more open to fudges on various points than others. But we can hardly go in and say that uh, now. Uh, all the more so, we devoted the great bulk of our negotiating capital in the first round of this to Northern Ireland. And insofar as the Irish issue is back at the table, then clearly um, we will have to focus a lot of our attention on that as well. But I don't think it's an either or choice, to be honest. Even if there weren't the Irish issue, um, there would be difficulty in us playing a, a distinctive role uh, in the negotiations. Then finally, chances of a deal. I mean, people are always asking, is there a 30% chance, is there a 40% chance, is there a 50% chance? I know from long experience of negotiations, these are nearly always stabs in the dark. They're bullshit. There's a roller coaster. Um, people are optimistic one day, pessimistic the next. And like I said, we have been here before. Um, but finally, um, the deal, as I said, is by no means guaranteed. And it is certainly conceivable, it's certainly conceivable that Johnson has decided that even from a party political point of view, it's easier to go with no deal um, than to make compromises. I'm not sure that he faces, you know, in reality, real challenges from within his party on this, uh, but we shall see. I tend to think that it's more likely that there'll be a deal than not. I think the logic of a deal is strong. And like I say, I'm not sure what the downside is for him uh, of making the compromises required, uh, but we shall see. And then finally, to the, to the question, can things only get better? Um, I think it's clear from what I've said that the answer to that, I'm afraid, is no. Uh, things can get a great deal worse, even if I hope they won't. Thank you. Oh, geez, we seem to have lost Robert there. Um, thank you very much uh, for that, Rory. That was wonderful. And um, we might uh, go straight on to the next speaker, if that's okay. If, not, uh, if you're ready. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Maeve. Um, it's a it's a real honour to be part of this conference, and uh, um, and at this particular time as well. And I really appreciated the question that you posed us. Um, as Rory has addressed, and um, obviously it's a very timely one. And uh, in my remarks, I'm going to reflect on that question, but also concentrate in particular on this UK internal market bill. <clears throat> um, yesterday, I, was, I, I got a, a WhatsApp message uh, from a colleague and basically talking about some news about the Trader Support Service. Uh, which is yet to hit the headlines, and also obviously reflecting on the Secretary of State's comments yesterday. And the question that we asked ourselves is really, why, why are we surprised? I think this, this sense of constant bewilderment possibly should have left us by now, especially for those of us who've been observing uh, the Brexit process so closely. And the reason why we're surprised, I think, is because we always have this assumption, particularly those of us working perhaps on the island of Ireland, but working, working with an assumption about democratic governance and about responsibility, particularly towards the peace process. And those assumptions really can't be taken for granted anymore. Uh, they've all but disappeared in many ways and certainly they're under threat um, uh, most particularly. And those assumptions that we saw behind the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, um, and in fact that were evident in it, are absolutely crucial. I just sort of the very general assumptions, but I sort of want to remind ourselves of them. And those are the principles, of course, of the, the uh, close relationship between Britain and Ireland, one that we don't really have much choice in, uh, but that, that is um, historically forged and which will continue. Um, the need for long-term planning, thinking in particular about the next generation, the need for compromise always, 
Northern Ireland is at the fulcrum of the UK and Ireland, and indeed Britain and Ireland, and indeed between the UK and the EU, compromise will continue to be necessary. And of course, what made the Good Friday Agreement possible was the context of the European Union. And we know that this context was crucial, not just in political terms, even perhaps in cultural terms, uh, but also legal ones too. And that context of the European Union and the single market, um, amongst many other things, made devolution possible. Uh, the devolution that we saw necessary for the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, but also that happened across the UK. And I'll come back to that, as you'll expect. Um, so the question about whether things can only get better, um, I want to twist that a little bit and say, well, what can prevent things from getting worse? Um, and perhaps, uh, it, you know, fundamentally, uh, we have that sense of a uh, sense of responsibility, not just ownership over the peace process, but responsibility towards it. A sense of trust that can prevent things getting wor worse. If we have trustworthiness built, if we have obviously mutual respect, which is a phrase used um, quite blithely these days, and also that point of good faith, another phrase used quite blithely, but those can prevent things from getting worse. Fundamentally, of course, respect for law, um, uh, uh, principles of accountability and principles of predictability. Now, I would be, I would have many criticisms of the protocol, and I think some of those are questionable, uh, some of those principles are questionable in relation to the protocol, particularly, for example, with regards to accountability and our ability, particularly from democratic institutions in Northern Ireland, to be able to scrutinise the decisions that are being made and have such consequence for our future. Um, anyway, I've rather been overtaken by events, and so I will concentrate instead on thinking about where we are right now. And it's worth remembering that the purpose of the protocol, the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, was firstly to protect the Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all its parts, to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. And crucially, the difference between this protocol and, and the previous version was that it would allow regulatory divergence between, the, you know, between GB and the EU. This was a principle that um, Boris Johnson was very keen upon, of course. And this is why we are where we are. Now, to the bill that's on the table, and I have seen a copy of the bill, and I don't actually know if it's been presented yet in the House of Commons, so I'm going to be a little bit careful about what I say, but, but um, uh, you'll all know a lot of the detail very shortly. But the purpose of the UK Internal Market Bill uh, is put very simply, to preserve the UK Internal Market. Now, the, thing, the reason why that's interesting is because that was a concept that was really not in existence until Brexit. Um, it, the white paper that we saw uh, in July defined the UK internal market rather vaguely as a total set of relationships across the United Kingdom. Um, but fundamentally, we sort of get a sense of what they mean by the internal market of the UK. Um, and the reason why this legislation was seen as being necessary, and I'll talk about its origins in a minute, was that it was the EU single market that held the United Kingdom together. So it enabled the devolved, uh, the constituent parts of the UK um, to have, in fact, increasing powers, and for that all to be absolutely fine because it came within the, the uh, body and umbrella of the single market of the European Union. Now, early on in Brexit, it was recognised that uh, it was difficult to um, hold uh, things together outside of the single market. There's a possibility of growing divergence within the UK. Um, and there was an agreement between the various parts of the UK as to how to manage this. So they looked at um, areas that would be affected by um, divergence between the various parts of the UK. And some they said, that's fine, we don't, that divergence doesn't matter. And others they said, well, we can come to some sort of loose agreement, maybe a memorandum of understanding, and that will be sufficient. And then others they said, we'll need some legislation, common frameworks um, to be put into place. And there was some progress being made on, that common, on those common framework legislation. Um, it was changed somewhat, of course, by the, by the protocol and the fact that Northern Ireland was put in a very distinct position, and I'll come back to that. Um, we heard rumours um, in the springtime um, that the UK government, particularly the Cabinet Office, was planning UK-wide legislation, which immediately um, upset, to say the least, uh, Scotland and Wales. Um, and then we saw this white paper in July. 
and essentially is putting forward a market access commitment, which is to protect the UK internal market um, through principles of mutual recognition and non-discrimination. Um, and in effect, um, those of us reading it from Northern Ireland Ireland perspective knew it really meant not very much for us because um, um, those principles cannot really apply in Northern Ireland because everything entering Northern Ireland is meant to comply with EU rules and is obviously subject to the, the EU rules. Um, uh, however, it did concern us about Northern Ireland goods having access into GB. So when there was consultation on, that's really what Northern Ireland businesses emphasised, the need for access into the GB market. Um, the, the, we always knew this internal market bill was going to be controversial. Um, um, it's viewed with great wariness uh, by Scotland and Wales, um, and of course here as well, primarily seen as a power grab from London. And put very simply, it's because those principles of mutual, non, uh, mutual recognition and non-discrimination actually don't mean very much uh, in, a, in an internal market defined and, and moderated as it is in the UK, in that Yes, Scotland and Wales can have their own legislation about things, but those principles applying means that they can't have, uh, prevent goods made to different standards in England from entering and being sold in Scotland and Wales. Um, or indeed, goods are allowed to enter uh, uh, England, um, then being able to be sold in Scotland and Wales. Um, and uh, as a result, they therefore saw this as a great um, diminution of their powers. And we'll see a lot of that debate uh, today, although less so given the other elements of this bill, uh, which I will come on to now. So the controversial remarks made by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland yesterday, um, uh, including the comments that yes, uh, we, this, this will break international law. And having watched that very closely, I took some comfort from the fact that he seemed to be saying these powers that will break international law will just be used uh, in the event of a no deal. And also it's just about NI access into GB. So that seemed to imply uh, then that it's, um, they do intend to implement the protocol, otherwise there'd be no need for that particular commitment. However, having looked at the bill, uh, I, those reassurances that I might have taken from his comments yesterday are, are um, proved rather null and void. Um, and I'll just summarise them very briefly. So first and foremost, the context of no deal isn't there at all. So basically those powers are being given will be, if it's passed, will be given to uh, UK ministers, regardless of the outcome of a UK EU negotiation or indeed joint committee decision. So there are four main elements. The first is about Northern Ireland's pl integral place within the United Kingdom and prioritizing that um, um, by UK authorities, including when it comes to GB into NI movement of goods. Um, so that principle of strengthening and maintaining the integrity of the United Kingdom internal market, a very unusual pointed phrase, uh, that that is to be upheld by all UK authorities when exercising functions in relation to um, the protocol. The second point is unfettered access, basically effect effectively barring UK authorities from doing anything that in, would um, in, impede unfettered access from NI into GB. Um, and then we come on to the, the really, uh, the, <laughs> the, the particularly um, striking parts of this bill, uh, which are about modifying the past to modify or disapply uh, certain elements. So one of those relates to unfettered, unfettered access and that includes export declarations. So that point that we knew is a point of contention between the UK and the EU, uh, that, that those powers are being taken to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to choose to, to modify or disapply those uh, requirements. And then the other element is about modifying or disapplying elements of Article 10, which relates to state aid, um, which is very sensitive, as we know, not just in the UK EU uh, matters, but most particularly uh, the UK has slowly realised that um, EU state aid rules will apply for all of the UK when it uh, relates to trade, um, uh, sorry, when, uh, with regards to trade affecting, um, coming under the rules of the protocol. And I can explain this in more detail, I'm just trying to be brief. Um, so this is highly <laughs> explosive. And um, we're already seeing the outcome of this, uh, you know, the request for an urgent uh, emergency meeting of the joint committee, et cetera. Um, and it almost seems, as Rory is touching on there, it's, it almost seems 
deliberately provocative and we could spend a lot of time wondering about the ultimate purpose of it. I'm sure part of it is using Northern Ireland in some ways to be able to um, uh, sort of um, up, up the ante when it comes to the state aid issue in particular. So uh, can things only get better? No. Can things get worse? Yes, definitely so. And we're in for a very rocky time and uh, we'll see the consequences of that not just in the UK-EU relationship, not just in Ireland, but also within Northern Ireland as well. Um, but I return us to the point I was making at the start about what makes us surprised about these things? You know, why do we continue to be, uh, you know, those things that make us somewhat bewildered is because of those principles of the Good Friday Agreement that were so important to begin with. And I would just urge that we concentrate on those things once more, the principle of accountability, the principle of compromise, and the principle of long-term planning too. And I hope that amid all the flurry and the concern that uh, we'll be able to focus on the longer term and what's um, in, most particularly in Northern Ireland's best interest um, into the next generation. Thank you. Well, Cathy, thank you very much for, for that, uh, for that presentation, much appreciated. And sorry, my sound went just before you, you came in there. So apologies uh, for, 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 for that. Uh, our final speaker is uh, Ben Breen uh, from, uh, from Deeper. And following that, we'll open it up to Q&A. So I only have one question so far in the Q&A. So please, uh, please use the facility and uh, type in your question because the panelists are very keen to hear from people and very keen to engage in discussion and debate after Ben has spoken. So Ben, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, just confirm that you can see my screen there, Robert. Yeah, I can see it. Perfect, okay, well, thank you very much to the uh, Dublin Economic Workshop for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, uh, this is just some work that we've carried out in the IGs in the last few months. Um, it's uh, the product of a spending review uh, carried out by myself and some of my colleagues. So, just to give a bit of context, um, how the loan schemes fit into the issue of Brexit, um, I suppose uh, th they would have had their advent uh, after the financial crisis during the credit constraints that existed at the time. Um, and, but then they really emerged as a policy instrument when uh, Brexit occurred. So several schemes came on stream around that time. Uh, and then in the next couple of years, they were in process. And of course, we, we're where we are today with uh, COVID, so these schemes have been called on again as an instrument to try to address some of the issues associated with that crisis. So uh, to, to frame the talk then, it's very much a case that these schemes were uh, uh, developed, uh, ramped up as a, result of, as a result of Brexit, and uh, have now become a, a COVID measure in lots of instances, but will remain there uh, in time, and Brexit hasn't gone away. So these schemes and their, their applicability to Brexit is still still as, as relevant as it ever was, even though we're, we're, they're currently also there to address COVID. So in terms of the presentation overall, I'll run through the, the reason to of these types of schemes, which is market failure, uh, talk a bit about that, and then how the schemes have come to exist over time, uh, chronologically. Um, then I'll talk about the specifics of the loan schemes. They have their own unique traits and, and, and uh, terms. And then the levels of uptake that we've seen uh, nationally with the data as we have it now. So the data currently brings us up to April 2020. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the results of that data and um, uh, further analysis of, of, COVID, of COVID time uptake will we'll, we'll have to um, feature when that data is available. So after I've talked about that, then I'll talk about the recent expansion in these schemes. This expansion is very much the result of the COVID pandemic. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit and some of the implications of that increased expansion and then I'll talk about some of the further considerations and the conclusions. Okay, so context, first of all. So market failure in the SME access to credit is a fairly well-documented um, market phenomenon. Basically, you have uh, a lack of security and collateral. You're talking about small firms, uh, don't have big balance sheets, don't have a lot of assets. So it's difficult for banks to weigh up the pros and cons of, of lending to these types of firms. Um, it's, it's not a case where you can just liquidate their assets and, and, and will cover any losses on defaults. So because of that, that conditionality and the fact that you have such asymmetric information, firms know more about themselves than the than banks do, um, the banks have this perception of a higher default risk. And it's not necessarily a flawed perception. 
there is, you know, tends to be higher levels of default in that market because you have a lot of startups, new companies, more risk, etc. So the outcome of that market failure, if you want, is uh, the economic impact is a limited investment, uh, a limit in the creation of jobs. And from that then is, is a limitation in the amount of, you know, future growth that comes down the road, but not just from jobs and growth in those companies that could have borrowed, but the whole issue of clusters and innovation within sectors that can arise over time. Um, that, that can be, uh, if you want, uh, undermined by, by this, uh, this market failure. And so it can have an, a long-term impact on growth in that regard. So state policies then to try to address that market failure um, in terms of loan schemes can involve state guarantees where the state uh, op offers to provide a certain amount of uh, coverage of losses that the banks incur from lending to small to medium enterprises, but also uh, the setting up of bes bespoke entities that carry out the, carry out the lending process themselves in-house, uh, lending directly to firms. So generally speaking, in the Irish case, the, the tendency is towards uh, the, the former, the credit guarantee type scenario. And uh, that's that's similar pattern internationally. Um, the pros of the of the of the guarantee uh, approach, the credit guarantee approach, is that first of all, you are um, utilizing the skills of the banks who are in the business of lending, so they have an entire you know logistics set up around that. But also as well, you're you're helping to foster relationships between um, between banks and possible borrowers. So then in the long term, once those relationships are established. Uh, they can take place uh, purely in, in a private uh, fashion without the need for state intervention. So to evaluate these schemes then, uh, uh, two key variables to keep in mind are the issue of fin financial and economic additionality. So this is basically the, the economic lending and the economic growth, sorry, the financial lending and economic growth that would not have taken place without the state supported lending. So the increase in jobs and employment, et cetera, that would have taken place anyway, it, is, it cannot be counted towards the benefit of the schemes. And if the schemes are involved in that kind of growth or that kind of financial lending, it's considered a deadweight loss, which is a, a you know, there's no, there's no return on the state's investment for that. So the, the, the deadweight loss internationally has been recorded anywhere from the 30th percentile to the 70th, uh, which is quite high. But it is encouraging to note that uh, cost benefit analyses uh, show, uh, regularly show that even with high levels of, of deadweight loss, uh, even up at 60, 70 percent, you can still see a positive benefit to cost ratio. And that's if the, if the economic benefits of the schemes are, are effective, um, then uh, you can still have high, high, high gains for society, even though the deadweight, deadweight loss is high. Okay, so in terms then of how these schemes evolved uh, or, or arose over time, um, we go back to the financial crisis of 2008. In 2012, the government at the time had an action plan for jobs which basically set out to create 100,000 jobs or by 2016. So towards that goal, uh, the, the small to medium enterprise sector being such a significant employer nationally, um, they set up the microfinance Ireland scheme and the credit guarantee scheme. So th that was an attempt to basically try to provide capital to firms that wanted to grow, to reinvest, to produce jobs and, 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 uh, and growth. The microfinance scheme was at, at the smaller end of the scale. It provided loans of about 25,000 to firms with less than 10 employees. The credit guarantee scheme then was loans of up to 1 million euro for, um, for larger size firms. So that ran for until 2016 when, when Brexit started to become an issue. And uh, these loan schemes, the guarantee schemes specifically, were called on again then as a mechanism to try to provide supports, liquidity to businesses impacted by, as I set out there, by Brexit, uh, uh, but also impacted by agricultural market volatility, which also arose at the time. And what was, what was unique about the schemes at this, at this juncture from 2017 on was that they had EU co-financing from the European Investment Fund. So what that basically meant was that though the state would offer an 80% guarantee on, on losses for the banks in, in the lending process, this guarantee from the Irish state would be counter-guaranteed by the European Investment Fund, so significantly reducing the lever level of exposure the Irish state had as a result of the schemes. Cut to 2020, COVID-19, um, we're seeing an increase in financing available through most of these existing schemes. Uh, the Brexit loan scheme has been rebranded into the COVID-19 working capital loan scheme. Uh, the credit guarantee scheme has seen an increase in the financing available, significant increase in the financing available, 
and the future growth loan scheme as well has also increased significantly. So I'll talk more about those in a minute. So just looking at some specifics then of state supported loans, um, that's a big table and there's a lot to take in, but I would just draw your attention to the extremes of the case. So if you look at Microfinance Ireland there, you can see there's a maximum loan value of 25,000. And you can compare that then to the maximum loan value of the future growth loan scheme, which is up to 3 million. Um, in terms of the loan terms as well, you can see there, there's a 10 year term for the future growth loan scheme and just three years for the Brexit and microfinance loan schemes. And these terms all have implications for the, the uptake of the schemes and how, 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 how desired they are by the banks, but also by uh, this, the SMEs themselves. And just on the bottom there, you'll see I have uh, put in the guarantee amount, but also the portfolio cap. So you see there's a 13% cap there on the portfolio, or sorry, on, on the guarantee for the credit guarantee scheme. And that's important because it, it can have an impact, again, on the desirability of these schemes for banks. So this next slide shows the historical scheme uptake uh, by April 2020. So over the life of the schemes, different life terms for different schemes because some are two years old, some are go back to 2012. But it just shows how much uptake there's been since the schemes began. So in the case of the credit guarantee scheme, that provided 150 million a year um, and over the course of the last eight years. So that amounts to 1.2 billion. And the uptake on that has been just 9%. So um, one possibility for that might be the, the, high, the, the low portfolio cap of 13%, which essentially capped how much of that 80% guarantee was applicable to banks uh, lending and their losses. Uh, similarly then, the Brexit loan scheme had a low level of uptake. Um, this didn't have the same uh, constraint. It didn't have the portfolio cap, but it had a very short loan term of three years. You compare that then to the future growth loan scheme, which just to the right there, the Brexit loan scheme, which essentially had the same amount of uh, guarantee, a similar interest rate, it actually had a slightly higher interest rate, but had significantly greater levels of, of uptake, despite the fact that it was set, the future growth loan scheme was set up in 2019, the Brexit loan scheme was set up in 2018, but there's obviously been far higher um, interest in the future growth loan scheme. And I think that's interesting for how these schemes are put together, just in terms of, it seems that the more tailored they are to their market, the more desired and effective they are. So the data seems to indicate that SMEs are interested in, in longer term lending if they can get it. About 94% of the, of the lending on the Brexit loan scheme was for the longer, longest term within the scheme, which was three years. And for the future growth loan scheme, about 75% was for the longest term within that scheme, which is about ten, eight to 10 years. So um, it's just important to keep these kind of specifics about the loans in mind uh, as they're um, hopefully more effective for firms. Looking then at the regional distribution of, of the state supported lending, again, up to April 2020, there's a lot going on in this slide, but the main thing to take away from it is that in terms of the, let's hover my mouse over there, in terms of the credit guarantee scheme, you can see that 45% of the uptake is in the Dublin area. Um, for, the, for, the, for the Brexit loan scheme, 34% is in the Dublin area. And then if you look at the pie chart there over on the right, that, that basically reflects the enterprise base nationally. So you can see that a concentration of small to medium enterprises are, are located uh, in, in the Dublin area. So the credit guarantee scheme, the Brexit loan scheme reflect that, whereas the future growth loan scheme and the agri cash flow scheme are more distributed nationally. So there's some uh, interesting observations there. Turning then very quickly to the expansion of the schemes. I mentioned that the schemes have expanded since COVID-19. So this uh, image gives a quick snapshot of the extent of those increases in financing available. So from 150 million uh, per annum available to the credit guarantee scheme, it's up, until, it's up to 2 billion. Uh, that was just announced this week, but um, it has a short life. So it's, it's due to expire the 31st of December, 2020. Um, but no, nonetheless, a significant increase for that period of time. Then in terms of the other schemes, the, the working capital loan scheme, basically that's the Brexit scheme that's been rehashed into the working capital loan scheme. So it includes the Brexit uh, financing that was available, but also an increased quantity. And you can see the future growth loan scheme there has increased also uh, this all in, in the last few months. So the key question for the exchequer is what does that mean in terms of exposure? Uh, it's not really just a case of, of, of calculating it out because it, it, like a lot of things, it, it depends on the specifics, the, the, the schemes themselves. So as I outlined there, things like portfolio caps, counter guarantees, and the actual uptake of borrowing when it takes place will determine the overall exposure risk, 
but the actual cost then will determine will be determined by the performance of each portfolio and the level of claims that arise. And obviously that can't be known in advance, it can be estimated, but it's not definite. So for schemes like the future growth loan scheme, uh, the working class loan scheme, uh, the working cost loan scheme, the working capital loan scheme, sorry, the scheme costs are usually upfront, which means that they can uh, include what the guaranteed amount will be and you have an estimate in advance of what they will be. Um, so there's a potential then if the loans, if the, if, the, if the lending overperforms, if the default rate is lower than what's expected, then the state will actually recoup some of the guarantee that they provided at the outset. Whereas with the credit guarantee scheme, you have a situation whereby the payment out to the banks, if losses are made, doesn't happen until later on in the scheme, until the losses are actually incurred. So the, the cost of the credit guarantee scheme is contingent on the uptake of the scheme and the default rate, and that can't be known in advance. But with, with no EIF counter guarantee and no um, portfolio cap, the portfolio cap has been removed in these recent COVID adjustments, then there is a significant amount of exposure there, but what that actually ends up being, we, we, um, we cannot tell at this time. So just to wrap up really quickly, um, theme, themes to monitor and assess in these schemes, there needs to be clarity in the objectives. Uh, at the outset, I talked about market failure and financial and economic additionality. More recently, um, there's been a relaxation of the uh, temporary framework for state aid measures to support the economy. So this allows for a relaxation of certain state aid rules um, to provide supports to businesses at this time. So I suppose there needs to be clarity in what the objectives are of the schemes, whether it's to address market failure or whether it's in support of role. And uh, perhaps over time, that, that those motive, motives will become more clear. Uh, in terms of the interest rates then, uh, how they're set is very important. So state aid rules assert that they should be uh, low to pass on the benefits to businesses, but if they're too low, they'll drive, um, they'll drive dead weight loss and attract firms that would otherwise have got loans anyway. And then finally, guarantees and portfolio caps. So there's, there's always this trade-off between incentivizing banks uh, to lend to SMEs, but also not giving them so many guarantees that the le lending becomes risky. And also as well, obviously, there's the, the issue of state exposure. So to wrap up really quickly, these schemes are a useful tool to leverage capital in the financial system um, to address market failure, but also, as we see now at this moment in time, to, to provide supports to businesses uh, at, at, a, at a very difficult time. Um, they've emerged as a solution due to the credit crisis of the past, uh, when credit was at a, at a premium. But um, following Brexit, they've become more of a, um, a policy approach to deal with major economic crises like Brexit, like agricultural market volatility and now COVID. So they're demonstrating their flexibility in that regard. But I suppose to be effective, they have to balance between, again, attracting borrowers and lenders, but avoiding the market distortions and, and, and keeping in mind of the exchequer exposure. And I think that as, as we go forward with these schemes and as they develop further, it'll be important um, that we are clear about their objectives and that their performance is measured according to the objectives. So with market, market uh, failure, that they can be evaluated for financial additionality, economic additionality, and if it's a support, then the, the, the metrics used to measure that um, are, are, are effective in doing so. Uh, thank you very much. But thank you, Ben, for, for that. Uh, uh, much appreciated. For a di different take from the previous two speakers, uh, and good to, good to have uh, good plenty of variety in, uh, in terms of the, of the presentations. Uh, so we have a number of questions coming in, and I'm going to try and moderate this. This is a little bit tricky uh, because there are many questions. We have all, almost 300 people on the, on the line, so as you can imagine, there are lots of questions and comments. So I'm going to try and do justice, if I can, to as many of them as possible. First, first group maybe for for uh, for for Rory and for uh, for for Katie, uh, the approach from the UK, the announcement of the UK the last two days. Uh, do we think that's a tactical? Again, this is very speculative, but is do we think that's a tactical move or, or something a bit more serious? And uh, related from Dermot O'Leary, what would be the EU attitude uh, to uh, the border and the protocol uh, if the UK? Uh, attempt to supersede elements of the protocol uh, with their with their bill. So they're sort of uh, related questions. Maybe Rory, do you want to have a go at those first? Yeah, by all means. Um, though Katie is the is the expert on the detail. Um, yep. I mean, on the ta look, I mean, we we simply do not know if this is a tactical move or not. I mean, it appears the news of the resignation of the Treasury Solicitor, the Chief Legal 
advised the British government yesterday it seems to have arisen from months of wrangling um, with the cabinet office. So this is, it seems unlikely that it's purely a question of, of tactics. Though, like I said, Kim Barrack, the former British Prime Rep to the EU, who was then pulled out of Washington after saying some honest things about Trump, I mean, he thinks it could be a kind of a, an attempt to sort of operate as a sort of madman um, approach whereby nobody will know what the British government will or won't do. So I don't know. I mean, I think part of the problem, as Katie said, is that, you know, this is a British government which frankly believes that whatever it says on any given day uh, is, the, is the truth. Um, it was remarkable to hear that Matt Hancock this morning uh, was talking about how the, the change was being made where above all about protecting the peace process. I mean, where it seems to me precisely the opposite that could be the effect. So you just don't know. I mean, it's a combination of incompetence, ignorance, in particular of the principles of the Good Friday Agreement as set out by Katie, um, and insouciance. But at the same time, it, maybe it is just a tactic. I, I don't know. To Dermot's question, there's no doubt that the EU would be very concerned um, by any uh, apparent breach in the protocol. A lot would depend, of course, on how the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland was to use the powers um, given uh, to him. But certainly before the deal was done last autumn, I mean, there were discussions going on, difficult discussions between the Commission and ourselves about what the fallback might be as regards protecting the border. So I think certainly you know, there would be an interest in the part of the Commission and of many other member states in, at the very least, looking very carefully at the implications of whatever happened for the border and we couldn't assume that the excellent outcome we finally achieved last year will, will stand in total or in all cases. Thanks, Rory. Uh, uh, Katie, any comments on, on uh, those two questions? Yes, I mean, I just would echo what Rory's saying. It's, it's um, possibly unpleasant <laughs> as well as um, ultimately unsatisfactory to sort of try and imagine what's going on in, in the cabinet, let alone in Boris Johnson's head. I mean, I do, I have been one of those ones who've been saying, I do think we're, we, we're just about likely to have a deal um, and that Boris Johnson wants a deal. And um, one can only just read it in light of the way that they've approached things before, which is very much pushing things to the last minute and doing lots of grandstanding. And I have to confess, you know, that's how I originally interpreted the stories about the the, the sort of um, the UK internal market bill emerging over the weekend. I just thought it was posturing really. And, and as I say, in reality, it seems much worse. I mean, fundamentally it's about, I, I think really uh, for all the stuff about Northern Ireland and about doing it for the peace process, uh, let alone for Northern Ireland's, the people of Northern Ireland business, etc that the fundamental intention was about, it was to make a point about state aid and uh, hence the vision in the bill to disapply Article N as it relates to areas outside Northern Ireland, specifically Great Britain. So there's something much more fundamental going on there, which does not um, reassure us at all about where it leaves uh, Northern Ireland. On the, on the hard border, so this is what we fear the most, of course, and they know that very well. Um, and it was interesting to see yesterday in the House of Commons, Steve Baker of the ERG, uh, recommending once more that Prosperity UK Alternative Arrangements Commission uh, have that uh, report brushed off where they re recommended alternative arrangements to the hard Irish border. And he was saying, isn't that the alternative to the protocol? So we know there's an awful lot of pressure on the protocol um, from people who are very influential within the government. Um, and the intention, you know, because pe people there really don't care that much about a hard border. Um, but fundamentally, I think part of the issue is we haven't, you know, the reality of Brexit hasn't sunk in. It still seems a little bit of a game for many people. And I do think um, that, uh, you know, as the reality of Brexit begins to dawn, come 1st of January, um, away from the Irish land border, the, the sea border, then, then we'll start to see a change because ultimately Boris Johnson is a populist. Um, and even if they left, um, if they, uh, you know, vacated the table, I think they'll be back around pretty soon uh, when, when the hard borders between GP and uh, EU really start to come to, into effect. 
Thanks, uh, uh, Katie. Just uh, related questions to this issue of the border and level playing field at state aids. A lot of them issues are, are interlinked, of course. Uh, Frank Barry asked a question. It was suggested this morning uh, that the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, would become irrelevant if a free trade agreement is reached. Uh, now, I guess, Katie, uh, well, I, I, you, you better answer it. I better not say anything. You, you, you answer it. Uh, I think it depends on the detail. But anyway, it's, 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 it was something you said this morning. Uh, is that correct? Uh, fundamentally, no, it's not, of course, because, um, you know, there's, there's lots of things going on. We're keeping an eye on three levels of negotiation here, the UKE relationship, which will definitely make a difference in terms of the hardness um, of the Irish Sea border, although I don't use, like using that term, but, but it will make a difference. Um, and of course, it also makes a difference in terms of the hardness of the Irish land border vis-a-vis -vis services, etc. Um, then there's the discussions of the Joint Committee about the implementation of the protocol in practice. And then there's all those other discussions that the UK is having with other countries that also will affect um, the, the future status of Northern Ireland in economic terms anyway. So no, the protocol, the sort of the, I think the consequences of it and indeed the negative effects of it uh, will be uh, much more sorely felt if there isn't an FTEs, FTA and the more comprehensive an FTA, the better it is the smoother the operation of the of the protocol, etc. Um, but it's certainly definitely not redundant if there is an, an FTA, um, not least because, um, you know, it's only Articles 5 to 10 that are about trade and all the other aspects of the protocol, um, which is so fundamentally important to Northern Ireland, including rights um, and North-South cooperation. Those things um, continue to be absolutely crucial um, uh, with or without an FTA. Yeah, just if I may add to that, no, oh, yeah. it's, I mean, if if that was said, um, no matter by whom, um, it's simply not not the case. I mean, as I said earlier, and as Michel Barnier made very clear last week, you know, even if there is an FTA, all the customs formalities will be required um, between Britain and uh, Great Britain and and the mainland European uh, mainland, and will be required between Great Britain and the Republic. Um, so that's one big problem, and of course, it's precisely the avoidance of that which is a, is a fundamental purpose of the protocol. I mean, as Katie says, there's no doubt that an FTA would in various ways um, make uh, the application of the protocol easier. And I quoted Sam Lowe earlier about saying that even in the event of a, um, in the event of a no deal, you know, that would certainly call into question the political fe feasibility um, of the protocol. Um, but, you know, no, no, it's a serious, it's a serious issue, um, to be honest. And, and you know, no, no matter what happens, there will be consequences for the GB EU border, which we hope there won't be, and which under the protocol there won't be uh, for the Ireland Northern Ireland border. A, a, a number of questions. One of them from Alan Duke's former finance minister about a lot of the coverage focusing on the issue of unre unrestricted access for Northern Ireland exports to the, the, the Great Britain, and people talk about that being a problem. But that's not really an issue for us. It's it's trade the other way in the event of. Of, uh, of tariffs and, and other non-tariff restrictions, Rory, is the real concern in terms of access to the single market, isn't it? Like a lot of the coverage, I think Alan's making the point, a lot of the coverage misses the, the real concern that the EU might have. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, whatever happens, I mean, part of the, I mean, technically under the protocol, you know, there is a requirement for people sending goods from Northern Ireland into the Great Britain market to complete some paperwork um, and that's one of the things, as I understand it, which is in question you know, through this new bill. But what's much more important, you're right, is managing the flow of goods um, from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and the dangers of leakage. And one of the things which is meant to be agreed by the Joint Committee, between, led by Michael Gove on the British side and Maros Shevkovich on the uh, Commission side, is to define what goods are, could potentially be diverted to the Republic and thence into the EU market. So he's right. I mean, that, that is much more important um, for yeah. us. And of course, again, just to make the point um, that the great bulk of British trade with Ireland is through Dublin, um, with the Republic is through, through Dublin. And whatever rules are agreed for Dover to Calais will also apply to, you know, Hollyhead, Dublin, Liverpool, Dublin. Can I, just yeah. add, sorry, Robert, can I just add one little thing on that, on the unfettered access, which hasn't got much coverage, but it's a real grave concern and uh, for Northern Ireland businesses is that unfettered access commitment, whatever it means, whether it means paperwork or not, um, only applies on goods going directly from NI into GB. 
um, which in many cases, you know, particularly in the agri-food sector, is, is actually not that much. Um, as you know, particularly accessing the south, south of England market and just-in-time um, uh, goods, uh, access via Dublin is key. And those access commitments don't stand for that. And this is a, this is a huge concern because essentially for many, um, it basically mean, means that unfettered access commitment is kind of uh, almost pointless um, if we don't get that unfettered access via Dublin, which raises all sorts of other questions, but it just shows the complexity of the matter. And also there's such a focus on, you know, the paperwork. That's not such a huge concern from businesses here. It's like, does unfettered access from the island of Ireland, or particularly from Northern Ireland, whichever route they get into GB, is that guaranteed? And most certainly it isn't at the moment. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a well-made point. R Rory, I, I haven't forgotten about Ben. We'll come back to you, Ben, in a, in a, in a minute. I'm just trying to uh, deal with some of these questions around the protocol and state aids and, and customs arrangements. So Rory mentioned a possible solution on the level playing field issues, uh, but how might that be arbitrated in the event of dispute? Uh, uh, and what's the likely UK view on proximity and equivalence? I know we touched on some of that already, but maybe Rory, any further comments on that? How we might arbitrate on, on level playing field issues in the event that yeah. we can't find a solution? Just, uh, I saw another questioner um, said, I, I think they thought I had sort of um, laid down the importance of the state A's issue. I didn't at all. I mean, in the negotiations, it's a huge point, but it's often the case that in a negotiation, the points which get the most attention are not in the longer term, though serious. And my point would simply be that if you look objectively at the figures, there would need to be a radical change in UK state aid policy, a really enormous change um, to bring it seriously out of line with its major competitors within the European Union, France and Germany. As I said, German state aid under the present rules, four times that relatively than, than British. No, I mean, I think the, I think the, 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 the outcome is clearly, I mean, it's been signaled by Barnier and, and others that so the EU began looking for a pretty rigid application by the British um, of um, you know, state aid, the EU state aid um, rule book. And now they've gradually moved to a point where what they want is kind of the overall level of, uh, an overall level of equivalence, as I, as I, as I, as I said, um, as the questioner said. So I think, I think it's very possible um, that you could find a deal in that area. As for the resolution, I mean, this is a problem because that comes back to the question of whether there's an overall dispute resolution arrangement or if there's not, um, if there's an overall overarching agreement. I mean, you can imagine sort of arbit specialist arbitration panels being, being set up um, with a mandate to act quite quickly. Um, and I think that's probably where you're going. The, Europe, the ECJ would only be involved when it came to interpreting European law. That's been a very major issue for the British. Just to make the point, in two, two points, I mean, one of the reasons the EU is so keen on this is that with Switzerland, I mean, unlike the case with the EEA countries, Norway and, and Iceland, there, there are over 100 bilateral agreements between the, British, the UK, the EU and Switzerland. And, you know, the EU has been trying desperately to put them into an overall framework, and the Swiss have been resistant. And the EU used the financial services equivalent um, arrangements as a weapon um, against the Swiss um, on this. So things can be interconnected and complicated, but I think a deal you know, should be possible. The trouble is that there is such a, two things, there is such a lack of trust, especially on the EU side. There is such a hang up on the British side about absolute sovereignty. And thirdly, there is this unresolved debate as it would appear within the British government and within the Conservative Party about how far they want to go with a radical new state aids policy. Dominic Cummings, it appears, wants to be able to spend vast amounts of money on you know, biotech and things of that sort. How credible is that in reality? It's very much at all. Again, as the as as someone was saying, I mean, the British, Mrs. Thatcher must be turning in her grave because the British were always the strongest champions of a rigorous state aid regime within the EU. So as I say, it would require an unbelievable vault fast to an institute a national um, a national scheme. So uh, let's see. Thanks, uh, uh, Rory. Just a, a few questions for Ben. Sorry, Ben, we're not neglect neglecting you. Uh, just on some of the economics of this and the, the economic response. Do we have a view on loans versus grants? Uh, and what's, what do the studies say about the demand for business to take up debt in, in, in uh, more difficult times, which I know is an issue we're, we're always uh, grappling with with some of these interventions. Are there any lessons uh, in terms of, of this approach to other market failures, perhaps in the whole energy space, energy efficiency space, Ben? 
and just a sort of fact, more, more, more questions rather than than specific uh, policy comments, but in terms of who sets the interest rates uh, and what are the incentive for banks to deploy uh, these resources? So Ben, you might have a go at some of those uh, some of those questions, please. Yeah, definitely. I'll jump in there. So on the issue of um, loans versus grants, so one of the aspects of these schemes that makes them attractive compared to grants is Obviously, if uh, funding is allocated through grants, then once it goes to said business, then it's in the system and there might be multi multiplier effects, but it's never coming back to the exchequer in, in, in a direct format. Whereas through the loan schemes, uh, essentially the European Investment Fund can leverage a certain amount, they can provide a certain amount of capital, which then mobilizes more capital in the system because the state will, the Irish state will provide a guarantee and then that will get the banks to uh, put some money into the system as well through the lending process. So in other words, what ends up happening is these loans are provided and all going well when they're paid back. Some of that money comes back to the banks and comes back to the exchequer. So there's a kind of a better cost uh, investment ratio there compared to direct grants. So that's, that's all in an ideal scenario. Then in terms of uh, the other question you had for me there, just one second. Is there any other lessons in terms of other market failures? Market failures more generally, Ben, in terms of how the state might intervene. A broader question, I know. Yeah. So, in, in, in terms of the, in terms of green energy, I mean, in in order for these schemes to be provided, and they're usually provided at the European level, there's there has to be a, a demonstrable market failure. It has to be shown, whether it be for small and medium enterprise or whether it's within individual sectors. What I will say is that, as you saw there, in terms of uptake of the schemes, the uptake seems to be far superior when the schemes are tailored to particular sectors, be it agriculture or the, the eight-year term loan for a particular part of the SME market that had issues with getting long-term debt. So I think that the more tailored schemes are and the more they've actually identified real existing market failures, rather than just throwing money at the problem, but finding where those market failures are, what's the structure, nature of them, and then structuring the schemes in such a way to address that specific market failure would probably be a lot more effective. Thanks, Ben. Ben, there's a, just while you're on, there's a, a, a lot of questions for participants. And just to say, there's, there's, there's at one stage almost 300 people participated, so it's great, great to see so many people uh, engaged. But Ben, there's a, a number of questions about the economic implications. Uh, obviously, we have uh, uh, difficult economic times because of the pandemic uh, and the necessary restrictions because of the public health emergency. Uh, on top of that, uh, no deal Brexit or limited trade deal What's, what's your sense of, uh, I know very speculative, very difficult to judge, but what's your sense of, of the economic impacts? Uh, with all of these different crises in, in tow, um, I suppose it, uh, it really remains to be seen what the impact is on, on demand. I think one of the positive things we've seen recently is that income tax hasn't been too uh, negatively impacted despite the high levels of job losses. The downside of that is the fact that it would seem to indicate that we have this two-tier um, level of, of, um, of economic well-being, but I suppose um, the more we can steady that ship and, and invest in the right sectors and have the right types of investment, I think it gives, gives cause for optimism. Um, certainly some of the employment data since the pandemic was at its peak is encouraging people coming back to work. We see the credit guarantee scheme coming on stream this week. There's a, a large the July stimulus with 9 billion capital spending planned for next year, so the investment is there. And um, I think there's uh, room for optimism, even though there are some challenges ahead, for sure. There's a, a question just in relation to direct grants, Ben. You know, direct grants bring a benefit to the economy uh, in terms of enhanced investment, increment of investment. Why shouldn't we consider participating in this element of the EU programs? Uh, like, are there elements of the EU programs that were decided not to, not to participate in? Um, you're asking me why we shouldn't participate in direct EU grant schemes? Yeah. I think it suggested that there's some opportunities for grants there which would help the economy that perhaps we're not, yeah. we're not enthusiastic yeah, about. Yeah, well, well, I don't think that the loan scheme should stand in isolation. They should be complemented, you know. If there's, a, if there's good quality grant schemes that can provide, uh, uh, you know, supports to businesses at this difficult time, uh, I suppose that the loan schemes are probably more suitable to firms that actually foresee the chance to reinvest and generate a profit. Grants can be more tailored to specific sectors and needs as, as time goes on. So there are there is uh, grants and funding available from Europe as we look down the next next year or two, and we should absolutely try to avail of that as, as much as we can to support the both the SME sector and the wider economy. 
A wider question again, maybe go back, thanks Ben, maybe go back to Rory and uh, Katie again. Just like, does this all suggest that ultimately the UK will be more of a disruptor on the edge of Europe? That really the strategic intent here is for the UK to adopt a fundamentally different approach than what it's taken over the last 50 years, that it will be uh, more independent, more disruptive, it will go its own way. I know again, we're speculating on particularly the, the Prime Minister's uh, objectives, but uh, Katie, Rory, any 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 thoughts on that question? Well, if, if I may, I mean, I think, I think there's no doubt. I mean, the purpose of Brexit, well, you may ask about the purpose of Brexit, but one of the purposes is obviously to restore British sovereignty, whatever that means, um, and for the UK to be freer, therefore, to use that sovereignty in different ways. Um, you know, how far it chooses to, 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 to deviate and be a disruptor, we just, we just don't know. Um, like I said about state aids, it seems to me that it would need, in reality, quite a substantial you know, change in its state aid policy um, to, to, for it really to disrupt um, the level playing field. Again, will the UK agree to lower environmental um, protections and, and labour protections? I, I don't know. I would have thought it might be a bit difficult um, for them domestically. But there's no doubt, I mean, they will be independent um, independent players. I think the EU will be glad, I mean, the leading players in the EU, as I said earlier, will be glad that the UK, certainly in terms of foreign policy, um, they have not so far uh, deviated much from their European partners, even vis-a-vis -vis the US, um, which is reassuring, I, I think. Um, but certainly, you know, there's a great fear. I mean, Barnier, you look at the speech, he's talking about you know, various things the British are looking for in the negotiations, which would basically give them a continued road haulage rights unchanged, continued energy um, energy market rights unchanged, continued um, conf you know, conformity assessments unchanged. And he fears in all of this there could be you know, lower and weaker standards. So it could become a disruptor, there's no question about it. That kind of is the logic um, of, of Brexit. Uh, but how far it goes, you know, we just don't know. And let's, and let's also remember, you know, this is one particular British government. I mean, I, second point I suppose is this, you know, let's see what, what effect Brexit actually has on the British economy. You know, people will come to a view as to whether, you know, um, it's been a good idea or a bad idea. Let's see how far they succeed with the idea of global Britain. Seems unlikely on the basis of what we see so far. Um, so there are so many unknowns, but a new, and a new government could al also I mean, change, change tack. Yeah. Thanks, Rory. Thanks, Rory. There are just two specific questions. Uh, one on uh, electricity market uh, from Derek Scully. So if there's a breakdown in relations, uh, no uh, free trade agreement, uh, how sustainable is the single electricity market, uh, which is one component of the question, very, a very important question. And then if there is divergence on state aid, uh, what would that mean? Uh, divergence on state aid, access to use the market and different climate actions, what would that impact upon, upon the single electricity market? I don't know if, if anybody has any views on that. And the second question related to transport, uh, comments last week that British proposals on road transport would allow British truckers to drive on EU roads without having to comply with the same work conditions as EU drivers. And this from Tom Ferris, I, again, that I know that would be problematic, I guess it's problematic from an EU perspective. So any comments on, on, on maybe the, the second question is really about working conditions in the transport sector and what that would mean. Uh, 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 and the, the first question is really about what uh, implications for the single electricity market if there was a breakdown in relations. Uh, Katie or Rory or Ben? Uh, I'm happy to say just a wee bit. I mean, yeah. uh, it's, I'm just setting myself up to be surprised again, but I do think that there is an intention to implement the protocol um, and including the, the provisions for the single electricity market. Um, and what I'm saying about this internal market bill is primarily they're using some of the Northern Ireland stuff to kind of um, uh, try and carve out um, exception for GB to kind of chance their arm in that regard, to put it one way. Um, so I do think a lot of the, I mean, the other provisions will stand and, and let's remember there's a comment, the question on it, which is a really important point that they are, you know, there's been millions already invested in the trader support service. Um, for yeah. which is a key element, of course, of um, ensuring that the protocol actually comes into effect. Um, so maybe we'll just do this one disaster at a time. <laughs> but I think we'll, we'll yeah. just maybe this. Uh, I think the, 
there isn't any sign at the moment that that's particularly under pressure. Yeah, just to just say that maybe Barnier last week did highlight um, the overall British approach to energy and the overall British approach to road transport um, as being among the problematic aspects of the talks. Though I think the understand feeling is that if the state aids and fisheries are sorted out, the other things will fall into place. I mean, as far as the island of Ireland is concerned, yeah, as Katie says, the protocol protects that, the single electricity market, I mean. Um, as regards haulage, I mean, what Tom Ferris said, it's precisely the fear um, that the Commission has, um, that the British are basically looking for British hauliers to be able to continue, including as regards cabotage uh, within the EU yeah. market, uh, on the same basis as now, um, without necessarily giving any guarantees about you know, health and safety rules and, and, and so on. So I imagine that there's an inter in the negotiation, there has to be an interplay between those two elements. Um, and maybe in the end of the day, there will be a, a willingness on the EU side to extend very extensive rights to the British um, and vice versa, you know, as long as there is in this area too, a, a level playing field. But I just don't know in the detail of the negotiation of where exactly they've got to. I might just Thanks. jump in there, add one more comment on the, the, on the road traffic side. I'm just thinking that if there's a situation where, you know, uh, there's more favorable terms or, or more wiggle room, we'll say, for UK drivers, um, you might potentially see an exodus of, of Irish haulier firms registering themselves outside, the, like in Northern Ireland or something like that. I know that the Ireland is heavily, obviously, reliant on the UK land bridge to get its products to France, Europe, and beyond. Um, and so the, 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 the specifics of the details there could it potentially have an e an impact for Ireland in terms of the enterprise side, in terms of where their firms choose to register themselves within the state or in, in Northern Ireland. Just, just on the land bridge, I mean, the positive thing is there's been a huge amount of work on this for a long time. And effectively, I think there is more or less agreement between the EU, the French and the Belgians, who are the two, the two sort of countries which have ports of relevance to us um, and ourselves, which will give Irish trucks priority um, when it comes to, to, to entering um, France or Belgium. Um, so right. that's what you think would dissuade people from yeah. moving. At the same time, I suppose it all depends how great the wiggle room would, would be and, and whether the different elements would cancel each other out. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks uh, for that. As if things aren't uh, complicated enough, William Hughes uh, has a, a question in relation to Scotland and, and Scotland's independence uh, and uh, speculating on what Scotland might do. But if they do become independent, uh, should the EU do more to support Scotland? Uh, that will require a very nuanced diplomatic response. So maybe Rory might give the diplomatic response uh, to what the EU should do in the event of, uh, of Scottish independence. Have regard to all the other uh, regions of the EU, which also uh, are looking at potential potential uh, separation or independence. Uh, Rory, give, give us the official give us the official response. Well, of course, I'm no longer an official, so I don't have to give the I official know, response. I but I'll give I'll give my best guess as to what the official response would be. I mean, obviously, we didn't we didn't um, take any sides in the referendum of 2014. We were sedulously neutral on it. I think I mean clearly Scotland is a very sensitive question, also vis-a-vis -vis Northern Ireland and the constitutional future of Northern Ireland. Um, so I think we would approach it carefully. I think if 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 Scotland became independent through a kind of legitimate process, and at the moment, of course, um, you know, the British government is very adamant that there won't be another referendum in Scotland. Is that position sustainable past the elections next year for the Assembly, Scottish Assembly, or Parliament? I don't know. Um, I think, obviously, in Spain in particular, there would be a lot of hesitation about this. But as I say, if it had happened, if Scottish independence occurred in, a, in, a, in an orderly and managed and consensual way, I think there would be very little option um, for the EU other than to um, admit Scotland uh, in. Whether Scotland, of course, would then want to, depending on the relationships between Scotland and, and England um, and the consequences of disrupting a union which has lasted for 313 years, I mean, let's, let's, let's see. Would the EU give Scotland any particular you know, economic supports? I don't see why it would. I mean, other than other than, you know, Scotland would be eligible for the various supports which are there um, at the moment. Thank you, Rory. T time is catching up on us. I know it's uh, 
it's, it's difficult uh, uh, to stay focused for, for almost an hour and a half. Uh, and we still have almost 200 people on the call. Uh, what we might try, we might try uh, wrap up uh, uh, and just any, uh, maybe, maybe uh, Katie first, any, any final thoughts, reflections on where we might be, again, a lot of speculation, but where we might be heading to over the next, uh, the next few weeks, months. And then we go to Ben and then Rory might, might, uh, might finish up for us. Okay. If you'd have asked me where we're going in the next couple of days, that would have been plenty, um, <laughs> plenty challenging enough. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, it'll be interesting to see the, what the Tory backbenchers do with regards to this internal market bill um, and whether they, uh, whether they buy the idea that it's about preserving the union and strengthening the integrity of the UK. That'll be very interesting as will um, public debate in, in the UK um, about the consequences of pollution. The state independence is much more um, live and it's made more live by all of this. Um, and uh, also whether the House of Lords, I'm sure there'll be many amendments made to the bill and the House of Lords will be absolutely crucial to ensuring that the UK doesn't uh, have the uh, in domestic law to breach international law. Uh, longer term, I, ca I can't see any progress being made until perhaps um, the, the you know Boris Johnson and Barnier get in get in a room together, um, and we have some um, you know, sort of behind the doors discussions. Maybe all the difference um, back in July last year. Thank you, Ben. Any any final reflections? Yeah, I suppose I'd focus on supports since that's what I discussed in my presentation. But I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, we're, we're trying to get gain control of this COVID situation, both in health terms and in economic terms. So it'll be interesting to see how the government supports today will, will um, you know, pan out in terms of businesses surviving and, and thriving and recovering into the future. And then to that end, how they then uh, overcome Brexit and the challenges that that, that creates. Um, and really just seeing how the supports, be they grants or, or, uh, or lending or what schemes are available, just seeing how, how businesses can make use of those, avail of those. And as challenge, challenging as it all is, there's probably learnings too for how we can maybe take stock of events and, and, make, and be, be uh, if you want, uh, a game ready in the future for future economic crises and shocks. That these, we're always learning about these supports and mechanisms. So just improving at, at tailoring them, I think that will be uh, something positive that comes out of this in the long run. We're, we're learning a lot about economic shocks in the last while, uh, Ben, but uh, so we should be well prepared. We should be well prepared, but it's a good point. Uh, thank you, Ben. Rory, any final, any final reflections, thoughts? Yeah, yeah just, just one little point, I think, to answer a question which you weren't able to pose, the question of EU support for Ireland in, in the event of Brexit. Just to say that a special dedicated Brexit kind of contingency fund was put into the multi-annual financial framework by the Commission at the 11th hour as part of getting a deal in July, pushed for by Ireland and Belgium, 5 billion euro. The detail of this, I don't know how it will work, etc., but it, it's there. Yeah, three three very broad points. The first is, like I said, the, the EU capitals at political level have not got engaged. And I think the British are still counting, as they did throughout the earlier stage of the process, on Angela Merkel and the rest of them riding to their rescue seems to be pretty unlikely. Um, and you know there will be support, I think, for Barnier and the Commission position. And like I said, the Commission has already in reality moved fair away uh, on some of the key points, whereas the British, as far as I see, uh, haven't. Then there's the question overall of British trustworthiness. I think you know one of the interesting things in the debate will not be so much the in the House of Commons over the Internal Market Bill will not be so much the specifics of how it might impact on Northern Ireland and the protocol, but on this basic question of whether the UK um, maintains its obligations under international law. Um, and I think, you know, Theresa May yesterday raised the point very forcefully, but so did I mean, Tom Tugentat, who's the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee and, and others. Will there be enough of them uh, in the Tory party to cause problems for, for, for Johnson and the government? I, I don't know. But there's no doubt that for the UK as a whole, and the point has been made that if the UK is hoping to strike deals all over the place with everybody, then, you know, it's been, to be frank, the UK, a very faithful adherent to international law. And of course, it was hugely responsible in 
drawing up the corpus of international law that exists. So that would be a major and a negative shift. And the third point just to make is that um, in a way, there was much talk of the implications of Brexit you know, for the constitutional debate in Ireland. And I don't want to get into that in any detail, obviously. Uh, but it seems to me that a, a functioning protocol um, would to take a lot of the sting out of Brexit, um, certainly as far as Irish nationalists were concerned. And even for the unionists, the odd thing is that Arlene Foster was talking last week in a, in a more moderate way about the need to work with the protocol. And of course, that position, as we saw from Sammy Wilson yesterday, has been thrown up in the air. But it seems to me if you were to have a more disruptive Brexit and you know issues again around the border, and that would either add a further most unwelcome element into a Northern Ireland political scene, which has to some extent calmed down. I mean, if you remember, you know, there was the deal on restoring the evolution in January, which was made possible in part by the fact that there was a deal on the Irish Protocol. And if that is through, I'm not saying that that will collapse, but it just makes things all the more difficult. And I think, but at the same time, I haven't seen it for years. I don't think that the Conservative government at any point has really understood the fundamentals of the Good Friday Agreement um, since they took over in 2010. And I'm afraid that the utter, as I said earlier, insouciance and ignorance with which they you know, approach it, um, you know, certainly depressing for the future. Well, thank you uh, to all our speakers for uh, their excellent contributions. And uh, thanks also to uh, people for, uh, for their questions and comments. Apologies, I couldn't uh, do justice to all of them. That's just a, a function of time and, and the nature of this new interaction. Uh, and finally, to thank uh, uh, the organizers uh, for organizing the, the event, very unusual this, this year, uh, we know, uh, but hopefully next year we'll, we'll, we'll get back to our traditional uh, uh, format and, and meet in, in, in person. Uh, but it's good that we can engage and we can still uh, have, have good conversations uh, like this. So, so again, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll be back again tomorrow at one o'clock uh, on a session, how can policy aid the recovery? So more discussions tomorrow. So thanks again to all the participants. Bye now.